every day. You're really going to care for the animals first. And wow. that has always been very difficult for my kids and um, the ladies of my life. Everybody's jealous. Do you live in the house with others? You can't get into my complex lifestyle. That's <laughs> not for prime time. Hey, hey, Tiger Crisis Podcast, episode two, which will focus on Tiger King on Netflix, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. Episode two, we're going to look at uh, this thing from the second episode. Uh, I, I know you've all watched ahead. I know you know what happens. But the only way to really break this thing down is to do it episode by episode. So that's how we're going to handle this thing moving forward. So episode two is called uh, The Cult of Personality. I want to remind everybody this is a highly speculative podcast made by a stand-up comedian. And uh, we're looking for some of the fun here. But also some of the, 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 the realities of what's really going on and some of the truth. What's interesting is when you make a documentary... Uh, you don't just let a bunch of people talk. You cut it together in a way that tells a story. And, and obviously, each episode has done just that. Uh, and so episode two is Cult of Personality, which is this weird, fun play on the idea that everybody involved in these big cat parks, zoos, backyard zoos, all of these things, is somehow involved in a cult. Um so it really takes the time to go through some of the humans working alongside tigers at these parks, introduces some new characters and some new factors. Uh, and it really, this episode really highlights the amount of eccentricity and ego uh, that permeates the show. Uh, Tiger, episode, uh, Tiger King episode two opens with a tiger attack. And I hate to say it, but that's what, I sort of predicted with episode one was everyone that ends up working with tigers, uh, eventually somebody gets eaten. It's uh, uh, Siegfried and Roy. I don't know why I couldn't figure out the name of the crew, but Siegfried and Roy got eaten by their tigers uh, in some sort of quote unquote freak accident. Um, but it's not the first time this type of thing has happened. Uh, and it's not going to be the last time that this type of thing will happen. Uh, so what happens is we open with this tiger attack and we find out that one of Joe Exotic's employees at GW Zoo uh, stuck her arm through the tiger cage and the tiger ripped her arm off. Now, what's fun with the memes and with a lot of what's going on around the Internet is uh, as soon as this happens, we see Joe in a paramedics uniform clearing the parking lot and seemingly being this sort of like medical professional. But the internet likes to point out the fact that he's just trying to look fly in his paramedics jacket. But what's interesting is we take that moment and, and there's like a, there's like a beat of sadness and panic and they're trying to make sure that the girl is safe. Uh, and then we cut to Joe with tears in his eyes. And the next thing out of Joe's mouth is, I will never financially recover from this. So right there, right even at that moment, we realize that all of this is about Joe personally. And that's how every one of these big cat owners seems to uh, run their life, is that the only thing that matters is me, then the cats, then maybe peripherally whoever's around. But you need to serve me, the cats serve me, and then you serve the cats. Uh, so we really do. We think that there's going to be this moment where Joe's sad about this person and her arm. Turns out he's just worried the place is going to get shut down. So right after that, he goes into the gift shop. And one of the most iconic scenes from this entire documentary, and he tells... Everyone in the gift shop. Listen, I got to be honest with you. Uh, one of my employees has got their arm ripped off by a tiger. She stuck her arm in the cage. Um, so if you guys want a refund or a rain check, uh, I'm happy to do so. That's what a wild thing. And you know what's weird is this is not this. This is what happens with these backyard zoos is there's a lot of this type of behavior. And I think. 
to be honest, it's got to be one of the reasons why you go to this type of establishment. Like every every town has its own zoo, so for you to deliberately go to the backyard zoo means you almost want something to go wrong in a sense, you know. Uh, so I think I think that's very a very interesting moment. So then the thing that happens right after this woman gets her arm ripped off in this episode is we cut immediately to interviewing her and her telling us that she did whatever she could to make sure that she uh, did not, like, put any bad publicity on the zoo. Like, she tells the doctors that rather than go through surgeries over two years, she would rather amputate her arm. And the reason was she didn't want to drag controversy for the park or for Joe, and she was super proud of the fact that she was back to work in seven days. Now, there's just something weird about this 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 beat, you know? It's like that's the first time we kind of realize, like, oh, this is not a person who's thinking clearly. This person is thinking about everyone else uh, and not, like, what, if there's going to be a time in your life that you are selfish, I think it would be the moment right after a tiger eats your arm off. I think that's a good time to start thinking about yourself and hashtag self-care. But instead, in fear, I'll think a little bit about her job and in fear, a little bit about uh, the tiger and a little bit about the zoo, and mostly it, something about this this weird like cult family that they've created. She doesn't want Joe to be mad at her. Like that's kind of the main through line on this thing, and it is. It's it's this weird thing that animal people do, uh, sort of in the same way that people who are being abused by their spouses they'll do anything to take the blame off the aggressor, right? So it's like I'm going to do anything but but take the blame, uh, let the blame land on Joe or the tiger. And so they make it so that it's not the animal's fault. And look, it's not an animal's fault uh, that it tears your arm off so easily. That's that's a fact, right? Uh, but it sort of highlights the fact that maybe you shouldn't be cohabitating with wild beasts. And it's just there's this moment where where you really understand that she does not process the severity of what's happened to her and it, she doesn't process the reality of the situation because she starts going off on this thing about how it's not a big deal that she got her arm torn off by a tiger because she works with a man with no legs. And then the next scene is we're talking to this hillbilly who lost his leg zip lining. Like, like how much more removed from your own experience that you got your arm ripped off by a tiger because you work with tigers, because you work with people, because the situation probably isn't perfect. And then you like blame the fact that or not blame, but you like you like liken it to the fact that that this other guy who doesn't have legs also works there. So like we're expecting to go to the guy and like he's telling a story about he got his legs eaten off by it. No, no, no. He he lost his legs in a hillbilly accident because he was drunk and probably like just having fun. So it's not it's not relevant at all. It's like the weirdest like analogy I've ever seen. It's like Somebody's in an interview and they're like, look, how can I be mad that my husband shot me? My brother got shot in Iraq. And we're like, okay, what are you talking about? What is this zipline like leg guy have to do with you and your arm being ripped off by a tiger in a weird situation? So the main preoccupation of this entire episode is the power aspect of tiger owners and the fact that every tiger owner flaunts his tiger like a person with an open carry gun policy flaunts their gun. Like they, they actually go into a piece of the episode where everyone in the episode is talking about the Endangered Species Act and they're talking about owning tigers as if it's the same as owning guns, as if the tigers were written into the Second Amendment. And then they go on this weird like quote journey. And I'm just going to read some of them because I think they tell so, so much of a story uh, uh, moving forward with the, with the documentary. Uh, Doc Antle. The first chunk of quote that he gives to the camera is anyone who says they don't love tigers is insecure and broken. Like what a weird 
what a weird perspective on the world is that if you don't like what I'm doing or you think that what I'm that this dangerous thing that I'm involved in, if you don't think that it's good and you don't love tigers, then there must be something wrong with you. So this is this is a classic example of someone who likes to manipulate people is that you you assert this this unprovable thing like. If you don't like tigers, you just must be insecure and broken. But it's got nothing to do with that. Like, I can love tigers and not love that your experience with tigers is probably bad for humanity and bad for tigerdom. Um, And then Carol, Carol, this weird lady who owns tigers, goes out of her way uh, throughout every episode to tell us about the egos of other people that own tigers. But somehow this does not apply to her. Same kind of thing. It's that it's that manipulative sort of like have the right answer, point out these things and try to come above the thing that you're involved in. I think we've all met manipulative people. Uh, so there's just a lot of these weird things. So Carol says they want to use those cats to elevate their status, which she's not wrong, but she's also part of the problem. Tim Stark, this sort of weird character that we find throughout the process who has friendships with everybody who owns tigers. I think he owns a tiger park in, in, uh, Ohio or Indiana somewhere. He goes off on this rant about the Endangered Species Act. About, he says, what's the first thing you should do if there's an endangered species? Duh, make more, not eliminate the source. He very clearly illustrates the fact that big tiger owners actually think that they are God. Uh, a guy who works for Mario, this this sort of highlights the point that, that comes into play later. It's like somebody asked him if he's scared, and he says, no, he has the coolest animals. And then Mario Tabro, we sort of build as this sort of Scarface character, and he says, look, I sold drugs to support my animal habit. And then he compares eating chocolate against your mother's will to owning cougars. He says, uh, we couldn't have pets in my house so what's the first thing you do when you get out of that house of course you buy cougars so there's there is just a weird like like power god complex thing in all of the people that we meet joe exotic for example there's this heart again this sort of like weird heartfelt moment of this guy who's supposed to be the hero where he's just looking at the camera and he's a little glassy eyed and he said animals don't judge you as long as you're good as at heart they don't care about your past so the whole experience of owning tigers is about is about ego It's about playing God. It's about creating your own religion, cult, or family. Um, And then we go deep, deep, deep into this dive of whether or not these are cult-type situations. We jump right into the fact that Doc Antle has five wives. Uh, and he's one of the key players in the the cat trade. And it turns out he's sort of friends with everybody, and sort of everybody involved in this documentary can sort of trace their cat ownership some in some way to Doc Antle um, and they all sort of look up to him and so then we go right into this Doc thing Doc Antle if you can imagine I think I said in the first episode like a guy who took on magic um, in high school but then never got out of it like like as a comedian I know a lot of characters who do magic and continue to do magic and they're the types of people that will lose their hair continue to have a ponytail and I don't know. They like have this weird like eccentricity that that's that's like proud of the fact that they are not fitting in. And then they use that 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 like individual nature to then inform why nothing then has to be the way that it is. So uh, in the documentary, we're interviewing Doc, and he's driving around the complex, and he's showing us his the houses of all of his partners, and he calls everybody a partner. Meanwhile, everybody else you're interviewing is calling his partners his wives. So the rumor is that Doc has five wives. Um, and then Doc, in the documentary, says this thing about how he's not going to go into his uh, his his 
his experience uh, of, of his family structure because it's not for the mainstream. And so when you start breaking down the pieces, you just really start to realize that he has created this quote unquote non-traditional family uh, to to like raise these tigers and and then the more you break down the pieces the more you start to realize like how gross it is um so here's other things so he starts says he's raising these animals takes a big cohesive family unit and then he starts describing taking on apprentices all female uh at as young as 17 and then they come on as teenagers and start to live on the property On the heels of this, we meet this young girl who lived on property for like 10 or 12 years. And the first thing her father says to her after he meets Doc Antle is don't fall in love with your boss. So there already is this quality about Doc that we find out that even other men can feel that this that this guy might be like a sexual problem. Um, So then he starts talking about his five partners and he calls them partners. And the grossest part of it is that he sort of describes them with their name that we find out later that he's given them. And then also we find out that he's also um, he's describing them with their physical attributes. So he'll be like, oh, see China over there. Uh, and he'll be like, oh, look, the, the lady over there uh, with the, the big teeth, the blonde lady with the big teeth and the beautiful smile. And it's just sort of gross, this t- the tiny Italian lady. This is how he describes his partners. He tours us around, and he shows us his partner's houses. And then he does. He does this thing. They, 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 the, the documentary filmmaker asks him if he cohabitates with any of these people. And then he says, uh, you can't get into my comp- complex lifestyle. It's not for prime time. So we come to find out that Doc... Is not a doctor. He is a doctor of mystical arts, uh, and that he forces the people on property to call him Bhagavan, which means Lord. And this is how he lives his life. He he uh, he he lets people in this in this experience know that the fastest way to get ahead is to have sex with Doc. Now, this is straight up from the girl who used to live on property. She says she finds out almost immediately that the that the way to get ahead in this in this organization is to bang Doc. And so it's always like in in the frame of her mind that maybe that's what she should do. And it's weird. So she starts telling us about the people that get hired on this apprenticeship, how they are all uh, virgins. And Doc's big preoccupation is to take their virginity and then tells these young ladies that now they are bonded for life. Like he's an avatar and his dick is like the tail with like the thingy things and they get bonded because they had their first sexual experience and now they're joined through AWA or whatever. Like this is his crazy cultish experience. And and it's like you we're leading down the path that this feels like a cult. And then we go, maybe not. Maybe this is not what this is going on. And then the more we interview Doc Ansel throughout the thing, we start to realize that it's even more of a cult than we thought because he does this thing. He starts talking about the hours and that you need to devote your time and your life. You need to let your 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 family relationships and your friendships fade away. You need to stop worrying about uh, holidays. And then all the documentary people do is they ask him, in this experience, uh, you know, when you ask somebody to not be able to take time off and do these sorts of things, and then he cuts the documentary people off, and he goes, look, you're leading me down a road where people are going to say that you just have to join a cult to be a tiger trainer, and, he've, and he's heard it all forever, and that people have compared him to a cult more than once. So... Doc is very smart to try and cut off any of the discussions that involve him being involved in a cult. But then you just go through down, down, the, down the path and you're like, look, Doc picks the women's names. He picks their clothes. He makes the women get breast implants. And he tells them that men are pigs and women are sheep. And every time we talk to one of the ladies in the park and they sort of seem sad about their experience that they don't have any time off. And anytime they point out any of the things that might be weird, like the pay... Um, then the women get sort of defensive and start talking about how this is their lifestyle and how not everybody can understand their lifestyle. Uh, they even said, like, there's a guy who's holding uh, um, 
uh, a bird on his shoulder and he starts talking about how the rest of the world is programmed to think that uh, they should have weekends off and how, you know, a, a, a job is sort of this nine to five experience and that's just not the type of thing that they're involved in. Everybody in this park thinks that they're involved in some sort of alternative lifestyle. Um, and you just find out that that's, that that's what these people have been like conditioned to understand is that they are, they are in, they're a greater experience and that, and that working for somebody for seven days, 12 hours a day is just part of the experience. Um, and they're paying the, the, both of these people, uh, Joe and doc are paying like a hundred to $150 a week. To their employees. So it really makes it hard and, and semi impossible to even sort of like get ahead in this experience. Joe uh, even says on camera, he says, look, he's he's uh, he's envious of Doc. He said, when I met Doc, Doc had uh, three wives uh, and now I have two husbands. He said, uh, you know, he's got his own little cult and I've got my little cult. And so Joe on the heels of Doc having his cult the way that he has, starts hiring ex-cons, homeless people, people that have no other options. Uh, he feeds them expired Walmart meat and he gives them dirty trailers and he, he says, look, you know, I'm going to keep you on the right path uh, as long as you work for me. Uh, so basically we learn that these like ego-driven, tiger-wielding men uh, are just using big cats as leverage to make all their sexual fantasies come true. That's the weirdest part of this whole thing, is that it seems like as long as you own tigers, you can convince somebody to do whatever you want sexually. These are not, these are, these are not traditional ideas. Okay, so Joe, Joe is, a, is a gay hillbilly, and we know that. But the, the, as the documentary starts to, uh, to stretch on, we, we, we see Joe in this three-way marriage, uh, with with a guy named John and a guy named Travis, and there's this sort of fun dynamic, and the, it's John and Travis are sort of, Travis are sort of on in the interviews talking about how they were naive and they didn't really know any better. But the more we watch this documentary, and this might be a spoiler if you've only made it to episode two, we find out that actually neither of these men are gay. So there's something about owning a tiger that allows you to live a polyamorous life. And and it's just interesting because it is. It's 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 men at power looking to have extra and and you know super relationships and these sort of open things and they've and and they just make the rules. And it is. It it, it just feeds into this sort of like man in power vibe that we've created across the U.S. especially, but even across the world, it's like if you're a man in power, if you have money, if you have tigers, uh, then you just get to have sex with whoever you want at, at, at all the levels. And uh, and you can cheat and you can have extra people around and, and there's really no rules because you figured out some way in the power dynamics to be able to add extra lovers to your situation, and I, and I think and I think that's wild. And and, and I, look, it's not any different than than what we're doing with anybody else rich. Uh, we are uh, like tacitly and sometimes openly uh, allowing people with money to have extramarital affairs. This is an extreme because there's tigers involved, and they're like they're these tiny little pockets of people that are not particularly desirable in any other fashion. And a lot of people that feel like they don't have a lot of other options. We come to find out that Joe's husbands are both um, sort of meth addicts. So we're, we're taking on people that, that don't have a lot of other choices and options. But, but even in, in this country, we've decided, and, and it's, it's a common uh, moniker, that if you are rich, if you're a millionaire, a billionaire, if you're a basketball player, if you play any of the other sports, basically we just let these men have a pass on sleeping around and if you're in entertainment all of these things like look i'm a comedian i see this thing left and right and it we like to think that it's sort of this like behind closed doors and like quiet thing but it really is more open than than we really want to admit we don't care that rich men and powerful men basically bang everyone uh, and it's just something that we need to stop um Having tigers just muddies the water. 
So we find out that Joe and Doc pay their employees $100 to $150 a week for this for the seven-hour job. Give them math, give them housing, give them dick, whatever. Um, and we're already, like, in that zone where we feel like these guys are taking advantage of everybody. And then we go straight to Carol Baskin, who owns this big cat rescue, who claims to have 100 tigers that she's rescued um, and that she's the only one who's allowed to have tigers. Everybody else is doing something wrong and she's doing something right. And so we go to her place and we find that um, she doesn't pay anyone. She's she's literally on camera talking about how it's not cool that Doc and Joe pay so little. And then the next thing she says on camera is uh, she doesn't pay anyone to help out with the tigers because people will do that for free. So all these little these little sound bites, all these little moments in the documentary, we start to realize what type of person we're dealing with, with Carol, with Joe, with Doc. So Joe is sort of this strange, hillbilly, gay, gun-toting, tiger-toting character who is a little lost, doesn't necessarily have an identity. His big thing is trying to convince straight men to be his husband, straight men to have sex with him, which happens, honestly, it's a thing that's in the gay community. It's hotter for a gay man to fantasize about converting a straight guy than it is to just, and I think that's what sort of every man is like, you want what you can't have. It's why women want to, or why men want to do butt stuff. It's because we're not supposed to have it. We all know it's not the better place, uh, but it is the place we're not supposed to have. So it's, it's that same vibe. And then we do all this stuff and then we meet Carol and she is, Whenever she has an opportunity to take advantage of a situation, she will. So she says on camera, why should she pay these people when they'll do it for free? And we come to find out she has like 200 volunteers that wear this sort of like color-coded T-shirt system. Like she's like the institution of karate. And these people have to pay for classes and then uh, work like horrible hours and then apply for the next level and then even on the heels of that we find out that uh carol says honestly that she actually probably doesn't know most of the people that are walking around her premise uh she sadly never knows who they are so there's no experience here working for carol or or, you know that 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 is going to work out in your favor you were a volunteer and you're sort of in this weird rundown backyard collection of 12 cats, even though she claims that it's hundreds of cats. Now, Carol has figured out over the years how to, in, uh, to, to like fundraise and market on Facebook. So she makes $20,000 a week on Facebook fundraisers, which she pays to no one. Um, and she even says things like, look, my email says judge me by the enemies I've made, not by the not by the, the, the company that I keep. So there's just there's this weird uh, competitive aspect to this woman that always wants to take advantage of anyone she can. So Carol Baskin comes into the documentary as this person who's doing whatever she can to try to shut down these other uh people's sources of income these other people's abilities to own cats meanwhile because she's claiming to be this loophole that takes cats and raises them after they've been in these traumatic situations and she gets to be the only character she's the only god character in her story she is the only person who's doing right by these animals and she's the only person who should then be able to take advantage of all of the 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 situations involved in it she wants laws to be written that only benefit her she now has the money to to be able to uh, facilitate that and I mean, look, Doc and and Joe sort of go through this like beat on the on the documentary where they just sort of start uh, bashing her facilities, and they say that her facilities are not uh, particularly conducive to tigers. It doesn't seem like that they're taking care of them. Also, it, it seems like both of them are under the impression she only has twelve cats in this place. And if that's true, then what does she need a hundred and fifty volunteers for? So at one point in the documentary, Joe rents a helicopter and he flies over the top to see if he could find these other ninety cats. Um so there's this this crazy scenario happening throughout the the, the first two episodes where we start to really 
uh, try and understand these characters, and it doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. Um, and then the end of the episode is this weird, is this weird sort of like spiral out where where Doc is is showing off a liger, but he won't call it a liger. And then we go into this other like trajectory where everybody starts telling us that you can't make money on a grown tiger. So you can only make money on the litter. And then that the whole time that they were working with Doc or around Doc is he was just creating litters of tigers. And then all of a sudden the tigers are just gone. And nobody knows where they go. Only Doc knows where they go. And then it has this weird moment at the end of the, the, the episode where Carol says, look, it takes a lot of people to lift a big cat. And then she just goes, unless you part him right there. And then she sort of pauses. And then the next five minutes of the episode are just an intro into episode three, which is about how everyone thinks that Carol killed her husband. So there's just these weird little moments where Carol will be talking and you think everything's cool. And then all of a sudden she'll say something so sinister and so crazy and so full of information that you're like, oh, this is going to come into play later. So this moment where she goes, look, it takes a lot of people to build a big cat. She starts talking in detail about hiding bodies. She starts talking about how you would have to have dirt on someone if you'd like, and you'd have to have like a, only like a, a very secure group of people that are in your inner circle that you have to have a lot of dirt on to be able to to keep this secret the secret being that you killed a tiger and then had to bury its body somewhere in the park uh, so she sort of in that weird OJ way uh, starts incriminating herself right there and that's and that's by the way before we know the rest of this which is this thing that Carol had a husband who disappeared so then the last four minutes of the episode are everyone we've seen so far just casually going, oh, and by the way, uh, Carol may have killed her husband and fed him to tigers. So there's just this weird uh, then like trajectory that we take at the end of the episode, which is the clickbait version of, of, of the cliffhanger for a documentary, which is watch this next episode. Uh, why is it that Carol has a husband that's probably dead and that was fed to tigers? Uh, and, and everybody's just saying it sort of like secondhand. And they're like, oh, what's it matter anyway? Carol fed her husband to a tiger. Um, so that's the second episode. Second episode is called uh, The Cult of Personality. And the, the, ta the big takeaways are basically, again, uh, if you own a tiger, then you can do whatever you want sexually. Look, if I knew... As a child, that all I had to do to make all my sexual fantasies come true was to own tigers. I think my life would be totally different. I think it would look a lot like Joe Exotic's life or a lot like Doc Ansel's life. Because if you got nobody judging you because all they're doing is looking at the tigers, then you can be whoever you want. And you don't have to conform to society in any way, shape, or form. And that's pretty much what we're dealing with with these people. Is these people have figured out how to become the, like, such specific like outliers in humanity that they can just do whatever they want. I, this is something about like getting to a certain level of humanity. And, and it is interesting because we saw this Mario Tabro character who, who likes, who likes to, to like compare himself to uh, Scarface. And he, he says that big thing. He says, he says, I sold drugs to, uh, to like keep up my big cat, uh, or my my giant or my exotic animal habit, and that really does show. It's like he's he figured out how to be a, a drug kingpin. Gets a hundred years in prison for being such an amazing drug kingpin, and so arrogant that he he got caught because he went on the phone on a wiretap phone, knowing it's wiretapped, and told him told the feds that they could buy drugs from him. Like this is the arrogance of these people. It's like I have a hundred tigers in my house. You will not arrest me. And that's the ego that we're looking at is a, is a group of people that have decided that they are above laws, they are above um, society, they are above monogamy, they are above humanity, that like financial aspect of life is not important, like all of these things. Uh, treating people properly doesn't matter. These are selfish people that want to own tigers so that they can have the type of sex that they've always dreamed about and become the type of lords and gods that they fathom in their minds. And 
they look around at the other people that own tigers and it's a constant reinforcement that you just get to do what you want if you own tigers so this is what we're going to end up following for the next five episodes is these people that think that they're god carol included they think that they can do whatever they want they can they can bring people into life remove people from life uh and bury bodies and uh there are no consequences and when you have that type of person and that type of ego nothing good can happen and that's what the tiger king uh entire documentary is as a bunch of gods trying to uh like get their will across a group of people and they've done such a good job of brainwashing other people that they've done such a good job of brainwashing themselves. And they say things that couldn't possibly be true. And they contradict themselves constantly. And and it's just a wild and fun experience to watch. Uh, check out the the uh, extras episode. Every week we're going to put out an episode and then we're going to follow it up with a, with a bonus episode, which is just sort of uh, some kind of debate or discussion uh, on a much shorter level. Appreciate you guys for listening. Uh, we started the podcast last week. Now we're on iTunes. We're on Google Play. We're on all the things that you can uh, get podcasts from. We are starting from Anchor. So check out check out our episodes on anchor.fm. But wherever podcasts are found, we have some content on YouTube. Uh, check that out. Thank you guys for listening and watching. My name is Dan Frigolette.